a Capitol Hill love scene, and one lean, mean Howard Dean. But first, it's been 23 days since Donald Trump became the next president of these United States. And while we've heard plenty from Trump thanks to ye old Twitter machine, we haven't seen him very much until today when he held his first public event since his uncharacteristically gracious and subdued election night speech. Trump is kicking off his victory lap thank you tour this evening, but that first event took place this afternoon in Indianapolis, where he basked in the glow of the deal that he and Mike Pence have struck with the carrier air conditioning company to keep about a thousand jobs from moving to Mexico next year. In the president-elect's brief speech, there was no shortage of self-aggrandizement and traditional Trumpian tangents, but his demeanor was calm and measured, and his message was optimistic about the nation's economic future. I just want to let all of the other companies know that we're going to do great things for business. There's no reason for them to leave anymore because your taxes are going to be at the very, very low end and your unnecessary regulations are going to be gone. We need regulations for safety and environment and things. But most of the regulations are nonsense. It's become a major industry, the writing of regulations. And that these companies aren't going to be leaving anymore. They're not going to be taking people's hearts out. Trump is heading to Cincinnati tonight for the first in a series of victory rallies over the coming days. So, Mark, on the basis of what we have seen so far at this Indianapolis event, what do you think we're going to see from Donald Trump on the rest of this victory rally tour? A very familiar guy. Stream of consciousness, self-congratulation, an emphasis on winning, mocking the media, liking the hats. I mean, it was, it was very similar. He didn't call her crooked Hillary, except for that. It was very similar to a campaign event. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. He got such great marks on his election night speech. I didn't hear a lot of that, either tone or those kind of lines. But I will say the Trump brand, as a successful political brand, has been emphasizing winning. This deal, for all its flaws, which we'll talk about, is winning. This is it. This is, I think, the version of president, more days than not, we're going to get come January. I thought that, you know, if, that, if that's right, and certainly that, that on the basis of the, of the Indianapolis event, it seems to suggest that we're going to see a lot of campaign-style Trump out there on the campaign, on this, uh, on this victory tour. Um, it seems to me that it, it makes clearer than ever that this tour is not so much about saying thank you, although that's part of it, but it's also just about, <laughs> amazingly, and I'm going to say these words and everyone is going to cringe when I say it, but it's really the first set of events of the 2020 re-election campaign. You know, Donald Trump uh, uh, managed, to, managed to win election uh, in a way that in some respects was predictable, in other words, was totally shocking, but by winning these, in, these Midwest states that had been part of the blue wall, Iowa, uh, Ohio, obviously, but also Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, places he's going, some of them, on this, on this tour. Indiana, one that he won by a lot, 19 points, I think. He understands that if he's going to get re-elected, he's got to maintain a strong basis for his political support in those places. And this is both in terms of substance and in terms of tone. I think what we're going to see for the next couple days is, hey, man, the permanent campaign is on and I'm already looking four years down the road. I, I say this without a judgment about the merits and I say this without really knowing the answer. And I say this even though Donald Trump didn't raise it. But the question is raised. Why didn't the current president do this? And I think Donald Trump today implicitly was on that was that was part of the victory lap well i think the answer is that the current president didn't want to um, do what i'm sure is now going to is about to happen is he did this the, the reason this deal happened was i think again we're going to talk about the merits of it in a second but you know it's it's about tax policy it's not about like a bunch of small inducements that got uh, laid out. We talked, we've heard about Indiana's role in this, but this is a larger thing that's going on with Carrier's parent company and wanting to stay in good stead in terms of defense contracts and in terms of tax reform going forward. And I don't think Barack Obama wanted to play that game. Well, he could have played the first one. So let's talk about the merits of this deal in the pub, whether it's in the public interest or not. In exchange for keeping those jobs in Indiana, the Hoosier State is going to give the company, it is said, $7 million in incentives over the next few years. The bigger issue, though, as John just suggested, may be the carrier's parent company, United Technology, wants to have some good standing with the incoming Trump administration. That conglomerate is a major defense contractor in addition to making air conditioners, and a lot of its business is with the federal government. 
The firm, of course, is also going to benefit from the fact that Trump, if he can, is going to try to cut corporate taxes and regulations. If they do that, if the administration, new administration does that, they will benefit. Lots of people do not like this deal, including the former presidential candidate, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. He is royally peeved. He published a scathing op-ed in the Washington Post today. In it, he criticized Trump for reversing on his campaign promise to slap tariffs on companies that try to flee the country and take jobs overseas. Sanders heard, quote, instead of a damn tax, the company would be rewarded with a damn tax cut. Wow. How's that for standing up to corporate greed? So, John, we talked about this yesterday. There's a few more facts known now about the agreement. What do you think? Well, look, I am not a big fan of tariffs, and I was never a fan of Trump's plans to slap taxes, as he put it. That's what uh, Sanders is referring to there. What he said about Carrier uh, just a few months ago was, I'm going to make them pay a damn tax. And that was he was talking about slapping tariffs on companies that wanted to move jobs overseas. I'm not a fan of that as public policy. But regardless of where you stand on that, it is 180 degrees out from what the deal is that he's now cut with Carrier, which is to promise that he's going to cut carriers and others taxes going forward. So I think Sanders is right to call out that this is a, a, hundred, a, a perfect reversal from what Trump's position was previously. And as I said before, I'm not for tariffs, but that is what he said he was going to do and he's doing the opposite. Yeah. You know, there are lots of flaws with this, and, and I agree with those who are critical of it and say that if a Democrat administration had done this, they'd be criticized for industrial policy, et cetera. I will say two things. The notion of a president cheerleading for jobs in an ad hoc, improvis improvisational way, I think, I think there's some positive there. The other thing is, you know, people say, well, other businesses are now going to demand the same thing. I'm not so sure that's true. I think there's now potentially going to be a culture of doing the right thing, keeping jobs here, even if it costs you more, and trying to get a PR benefit from that, even if you don't get all the same level of tax inducements and other breaks. My God, I've never thought I would ever call you Pollyannish, but it's the first time in the history of this show. Mark, it's a, Polly okay, it's a possibility. Mark Pollyanna, it's a possibility. Pollyanna Halperin. I just never thought it would happen, this, but here we are. This firm, I'll just say, this firm has got millions of dollars in free yeah. PR today. Millions. Yeah, millions. Yeah, they're also getting going to get a, probably a tax cut worth billions. Anyway, Donald Trump's courtship with Capitol Hill Republicans is sure to be something of a political soap opera next year. For now, Team Trump and the GOP leadership are still in that sweet nothings phase. Vice President-elect Mike Pence met with congressional Republicans yesterday, and both sides say they're ginning up some plans for a close, loving, productive, and definitely not same-sex union in the coming months. During a press conference today, House Speaker Paul Ryan addressed questions about one hot-button issue, Medicare, which he described as, quote, on a path to going bankrupt. But Ryan also said he's not yet talked to the Trump transition team about the controversial move of potentially privatizing Medicare, which Trump did not show much interest in during the campaign. Some other issues that could cause discord between the White House and Capitol Hill can emerge as Trump begins to flesh out his approach towards infrastructure, immigration, and the debt ceiling. So, Mark, is Donald Trump and Congress a love story or a looming lover's quarrel? Oh, it's both. Right now, <laughs> I, right now I, think it's, I think it's very close. I think that there are some substantive issues, particularly deficit, the debt ceiling, entitlement reform, that there's just a, it's just a huge gap between what Trump not only has talked about, but I think will push for, and what the traditional Republican position is. There's this huge issue about whether to cooperate with the Democrats or make accommodations to try to get bipartisan support for things. These, these will come a cropper before too long. But it is Trump's party. Trump is, you know, the, the co-equal branch that's more than co-equal. So uh, my guess is that eventually Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell are going to have to figure out how to accommodate themselves to Trump. But it's one step at a time. And I think the current step and the step towards both tax reform and infrastructure and the debt ceiling, I think, I think will go relatively smoothly under the circumstances. But we shall see. I think that, that may be right on those issues um, where there can be a lot of common ground and where, as you said, I think McConnell and uh, Ryan will see it as being in there and the party's political interest to give Trump some wins. I do think, yeah. look, on these big issues, Medicare reform, right? This is an issue, we talked about it all year long. We said part of the reason why Paul Ryan and, 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 and Donald Trump were not a match made in heaven was because they believed fundamentally different things about the biggest challenges the country faces on questions of domestic spending. Medicare is the biggest, right? And 
Paul Ryan has a, a long record of saying what he wants to do on Medicare, and Donald Trump wants to do something totally different. And so the yeah. question is, where do we go on that? Because that is, I mean, it's the, literally the biggest program in the federal yeah. government. And, it's, and, it comes, and it comes to a head. It's so easy to say, well, let's repeal the Affordable Care Act and take two or three years to figure yeah. out what to replace it. Right. You have to deal with Medicare and I think, and Medicaid. And I think the Republicans in Congress will be reluctant to say, we're going to pass this major piece of legislation getting rid of the Affordable Care Act. And not do anything not to Medicare. Deal. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. So there's some complexities. But right now, it's going pretty smoothly. And I'll say it for the upteenth time, Mike Pence right at the center of it. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, the former governor of Vermont, who also happens to be the former chairman of the Democratic Party. You say Howard, we say Dean after this quick break. And now our first guest, the former chair of the Democratic National Committee, post he held from 2005 to 2009, and a job he's trying to go back and claim again from Burlington, Vermont, the MSNBC political analyst, the former governor of Vermont, the <laughs> Howard Dean. Dr. Dean, thank you for joining us. Hey, guys. Um, Thanks. You, people, people get asked all the time, why did Hillary Clinton lose? Let me ask you this. Why have Democrats lost so many seats in the House and Senate and state legislatures over the last eight years? Because they haven't built a grassroots organization. And I, I don't particularly think this is a Barack Obama problem. Every time we have a Democratic president, um, the reelect, the DNC becomes the, the way of the reelect until the actual campaign starts. So what happens is the committee usually gets pretty hollowed out. Uh, the 50 state strategy pretty much died. There was not a lot of uh, attention paid by the DNC to the local parties. Uh, and there hasn't been an attention for a long time paid. Uh, to what the Republicans have done very well, which is school board members, city councilors, mayors. Those are the things, that's what really drives a party. And we haven't really invested in that. We do have a, a branch, the Gen Democratic uh, Legislative uh, Council, but uh, we don't fund it. And so yeah. we've got some really re so, strong reorganization that has to be done here. So, Governor Dean, that's a, that's a pretty uh, long list with some specifics. You like straight talk. You like accountability. Name two people who share part of the blame for the dynamics you just described. Nope, not going there. Thanks. Appreciate the ask, though. What's the, what's the point? <laughs> well, but how do you, how do you have, well, but how do you have accountability? Other than, other if you don't say, coffee. If you don't say, well, if you don't, if you're not willing to say this person didn't do it right, how, how is there any accountability? 
If it were a Republican who made mistakes, you'd say, this Republican messed this up. Why won't you name names within your own party to show people you get because, it? Because I'm in, I'm in the business of trying to keep the party together. One of the things I uh, want to try to avoid is a fight, for example, between the Bernie Sanders supporters and the Hillary Clinton supporters over this uh, chairmanship and this nomination. So, uh, you know, going looking backwards and blaming people, everybody has people they're going to blame. What's the point of my getting in that game? Howard, Ross, Ross Douthat, who's not a Democrat by any means, but who's a smart guy, wrote a pretty interesting story in The New York Times yesterday that talked about areas where the Democratic Party could conceivably, if it wanted to and thought it was part of the solution for trying to revitalize the party, move to the center, particularly on some cultural issues that might be problematic for the party where its kind of identity politics have, have run up against some of the realities of white working class voters that Donald Trump appealed to successfully in 2016. Do you think that that's part of what the party needs to do to try to make inroads again with that uh, constituency, again, that Trump did well with, but used to be a core part of the Democratic coalition? No, um, I actually the, the way. First of all, I think we have to start to stop talking about white working class people and start talking about working class people. Uh, if you don't like identity politics, then we shouldn't be talking about white working class people. All working class people face the same problems. Uh, people of color face greater problems because, of course, the discriminations. But uh, you know, w we need to be a broad party that appeals to people on economic grounds. Uh, which means all working class people who have gotten screwed uh, in the last 20, 20 years, and uh, evidently they're going to get screwed again by Trump. You know, for him to invest seven million dollars of the taxpayers' money for a thousand or for 800 jobs, while another 500 went to Mexico, that's a great PR deal in the first uh, few months, few first months or so after he's been elected president. But no governor in the country of either party knows. Every governor knows that that's not sustainable. So I think we just have to m organize better, and we've got to reach out and on economic grounds and show the working class that we are, in fact, the party of people who are going to uh, help people like that, who are struggling. Right. You did an interview the other day with uh, Canadian CTV uh, News, where you referred to Steve <coughs> Bannon as a Nazi. Um, I'm curious whether you genuinely believe that Steve Bannon is, in fact, a Nazi, and whether we're about to now we now are facing the prospect of a Nazi, a bona fide Nazi in the West Wing. Well, that's not a word I use without thinking about it carefully. So let's look at Breitbart News. They are anti-Semitic. They've been very blunt about that. Uh, they have uh, are certainly misogynistic. They've been very blunt about that. Uh, they have not stood up for the right. They're white supremacists. They've been very blunt about that. I think that's a fair word to describe that kind of an attitude. I don't think it belongs in the White House. Right. But you, you want to say you, you believe, again, I understand you, you, those are critical comments, and a lot of them certainly are fair when it comes to Breitbart News. But you're saying something different, I think. You're saying Steve Bannon is a Nazi. So I just want to make sure that that's what you actually believe. Himself. Steve Brannon ran Bright. Steve Brannon ran Breitbart News. He was abandoned. He was the one who published it. It was his uh, baby after Breitbart himself passed away. Uh, he is responsible for the content of Breitbart, and I think he owes America an apology, and I think he owes America an explanation. Dr. Dean, I, I wanted to move to a different topic, but I, I got to ask you again. You used the phrase before, reportedly in an interview. Are you standing by it, or are you saying he's just responsible for Breitbart? Is he a Nazi in your view, or not? He is somebody who's all the things that I just said, and I don't back off any of it. Okay. In in the coming months, uh, a lot of Democrats, would, despite Nancy Pelosi being reelected to lead the Democrats in the House. Uh, in the coming months, a lot of Democrats would like to see new young people emerge um, as faces of the party, leaders of the party. Who are two or three young Democrats who you think have the stature, the knowledge, the vision to become part of the mosaic face of the Democratic Party? I think there are a ton of them. So far, there are three of them running for the DNC, not including me, because I'm old and I think I, I'd like the idea of new blood. But so far, uh, the only candidate that kind of fits the bill is Jamie Harrison. Um, I don't think we can have a two-chair uh, DNC. We've tried that for eight years. It didn't work very well. I certainly don't think we can have a sitting congressperson as the chair of the DNC. That hasn't worked very well. I want to see younger people uh, run the DNC. I'm very happy to help. I don't have to be the chair. But it's got to be done right. This is a mechanical job. And if we don't focus on the mechanics and we run around giving speeches all the time without doing the groundwork that has to be done, we're not going to be any better off in 2020 than we are right now. Should the DNC continue to raise money from Wall Street interests? We should raise money from everybody who we can raise money from.
Howard, there's a, there's a story up on C at CNN today um, about Keith Ellison that talks about something we've known about that's been, been part of the public record for a while, which is his long uh, defense. Uh, he's distanced himself from the Nation of Islam more recently, but he has a long history of defending the Nation of Islam and defending Louis Farrakhan and, and defending Louis Farrakhan in particular about, against uh, accusations of anti-Semitism. This is coming up now in the context of him running for the same job you're running for, from. Do you think it's problematic at all, this history that Ellison has uh, in terms of defending Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam? Look, um, I, I don't want to I like Keith a lot. I campaigned with him when he first got elected because I thought it was important uh, that he be in Congress uh, representing American Muslims, which he has done a good job of. Um, I think that people evolve, and the, the, the remarks that he made in 2010 may not be appropriate today. I'd be the first person. I don't think you can defend Louis Farrakhan. Uh, but I think that Keith is an honorable, decent person who is not an anti-Semite. And I, I, don't, I don't intend to make a big deal out of those remarks. I really don't. I think people change. They learn. They grow. Hopefully, we'll see some growth in Donald Trump from the, uh, from the show that he gave us during the campaign. All right. Uh, Howard Dean, thank you. We say both Thanks Howard and we say Dean. Dr. Dean, thank you very much. When we come <laughs> back, we're going to talk with Kurt Anderson about the election of a guy he hasn't always gotten along perfectly with, Donald Trump, right after this. Welcome back. Our next guest has been writing about Donald Trump for decades. He's an author and the host of WNYC Studio 360 radio show. He's written for New York Magazine, The New Yorker, and Time Magazine. And, but, most seminally, he's one of the founders of the legendary Spy Magazine, which Donald Trump once lovingly called a piece of garbage. Here to talk about the election of his bete noir, we're joined by our friend, the great Kurt Anderson. Kurt, great to have you here. Hello, John. Happy um, to be here. I know you are horrified by Trump's election. Um, but are you totally surprised? Um, well, it's interesting, the revisionism that's going on in my own mind as it happened. I'm not as, t as totally surprised as many people because I didn't think it was as beyond possibility as everyone else did. I, 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 I'd been, I, what, when he decided to run, I was already in the middle of a book, essentially arguing that America had evolved over the last 50 hundreds of years to a place where a thing like Donald Trump could happen. The, the, the lack of care for empirical reality, for instance, uh, sort of teed us up to elect a person like Donald Trump. So I can't pretend like, yeah, I saw it coming, but I, I, I can't say I was shocked either. 
When you think back to the Donald Trump that you covered at SPY back yeah. in the day, yeah. um, the 1980s, early 90s yeah. Donald Trump, you know, forget about the campaign Donald Trump, because yeah. it seems to me the campaign Donald Trump and that Donald Trump are different. There's some things that are really similar, other things that are quite different. Yes. What kind of Donald Trump do you expect now on the basis of what you've known about Trump over the course of the longer time frame than a lot of people who've only been right. focused on him for a year? The thing that always uh, struck me and amazed me about Donald Trump as his central uh, proposition, humanly, was his need for attention. This pathological need for as much attention as possible for whatever reason under any circumstance. Well, President of the United States, that's about as much attention as you can get. So. Will he now become a happy and fulfilled person? I don't think so, because I also think he has a large hole in his soul that will not be filled up by the constant attention of being president. So what can we expect? Uh, I think we can expect a guy who doesn't know what he's doing for the first time. Apart from he's used to attention and he's used to deference. The presidents get both of those. Yeah. But he's not used to governing. He's not used to the consensus listen to a lot of different opinions and figure that out. He, he's not used to the, the, you know, having tens, hundreds of thousands of people working for him. Um, he's not used to, I mean, in the, when, as a, as a New York business person, he, he ran a pretty tight ship in terms of people not leaking, talking publicly yeah. about uh, dirty laundry. Well, that can't happen. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to be a very different thing for him. Um, you still maintain that he has unusually short fingers, right? Uh, absolutely. There's, there's, and, and that he said bigly, but yeah. All right. Okay. Kurt Anderson, stick around. <laughs> We're going to continue this conversation in just a moment. If you're watching us in Washington, D.C., you can listen to us also on the radio. Radio at Bloomberg 99.1 FM. That's FM. We'll be right back. We are back with the host with the most, the host of WNYC Studio 360 Radio, Kurt Anderson. Um, Kurt, I'd ask you, and just impressionistically, as you've dealt with around the uh, New York area, liberals, Hillary Clinton supporters, Democrats, where, do you, where are they, uh, again, sort of um, impressionistically, regarding yeah. adjusting to the notion of President Trump? Uh, well, like all trauma and horror, there's a half-life. And uh, I think, you know, people are, are, are coming to grips with it. I, I th there, there are interesting arguments going on among the, the you know, the liberal elite, uh, in which I spend a lot of time, uh, over 
okay, should we keep calling every Trump voter a racist or not, for instance, and, and those, kinds of, those kinds of discussions and debates. And, but there's also, I will say, a great eagerness among, pe among Hillary voters, among Democrats, among liberals, and not just young ones, to become engaged politically in a way that people haven't been beyond, you know, sharing things on Facebook. I mean, joint, creating new entities and joining old entities. So uh, that's a, that seems like a real thing to me, uh, that people right. are, are, are signing up to, you know, for the resistance, quote right. unquote. So now, in your, in your capacity as expert Trumpologist, yeah. you agree with me, he cares about what elites in New York think about him. It's not just he likes attention. He wants Kurt Anderson to think, wow, well, Trump's awesome, right? Uh, specifically, he wants me to think that. Yeah. No, he now, does He does care about what uh, elites think. And, of course, they've never accepted him. And he, so, to me, this, one of the stories of Donald Trump for the last 30, 40 years in New York City is this bridge and tunnel borough guy for, who has, despite his wealth, despite his success, despite it all, has never really been able to crack the elite. And, and he feels that contempt and will continue to feel that contempt. And indeed, the fact that voters in Michigan and Indiana and Alabama felt his feeling of that contempt of the elite is one of the reasons they thought, oh, he's like me, only he's got a billion dollars and a hot wife. Right, but so do you think it's possible that when he's negotiating with Republican conservatives in Congress that he'll think, well, this might be good for a working class voter in Indiana, but Maureen Dad won't like it one bit? Well, but I, I think it was, again, it depends on the audience and the moment and who he's trying to get over at a certain moment. That, that New York Times meeting was very telling. Oh, I think you're going to like my, what I do on the First Amendment. Uh, uh, you know, I think you're going to like what I do with uh, climate change. Well, uh, so uh, we'll see how passing and glancing that is, or if that's just, that's what he had to say that hour in order not to have it be uncomfortable, <laughs> or if he wants a more meaningful uh, 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 affirmation from the elite, which he could get, which, which if he were smart enough, he wouldn't have to do that much to make people, plenty of people, you, John, me, all of the elite, uh, say, you know, I was surprised. Well, I wouldn't have to do very much to make you say it, Mark, I know. But he, to, he, I, they would say, I'm surprised. He really did do this big infrastructure thing, and he didn't do this crazy constitution-busting thing. It wouldn't require very much move to the center sane precincts for him to get the credit that he has always craved. Do you, what do you think about what people think about Hillary Clinton at this point? I mean, and, and, and how much, I mean, if, it were, if I were a partisan Democrat, I would be enraged at the Clinton campaign and, and at, their, at the ways in which they failed in some really basic fundamental political tasks, like the idea that Hillary Clinton decided not to ever visit Wisconsin, and that was yeah. a state she lost, um, that, that this was an eminently defeatable opponent that somehow she managed to screw up and lose states like Pennsylvania, like Ohio, like Michigan, like Wisconsin, like Iowa, the Democrats have won for years, so cycle after cycle. Is there, why is, I, I don't detect as much rage about that yeah. as I expect or expected. Well, and, and to lose them, I mean, if she'd won, you know, she lost Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, and Wisconsin by a total of 80,000 votes, 80,000 votes. She wins those three states, she'd be president. So, yeah, although, I mean, beyond uh, a certain, you know, re pretty small group of professional or quasi-professional Democrats, like, really, are you, how much time are you going to spend thinking, oh, the get-out-the-vote thing was bad or she should have gone to Michigan more? It's over. It's, it's, like, it's like saying, oh, we got in this accident and I lost my legs and I'm paralyzed. But if we'd only, you know, we could have avoided okay. it. it the, the trauma is too great, I think, to get into the, the, the weeds of, of recrimination. Okay, so if you, you're not going to blame, if you're a Democrat, you're not going to blame Hillary Clinton. Um, but you want to sign up to try to, to join the resistance, right? Yeah, yeah. Presumably you also want to try to rehabilitate the Democratic Party and figure out, like, 
why it is presumably. the Democratic Party has like a lot. Well, presumably, I assume there are a lot of liberals out there who their attitude is this is what I should be doing, right? We should be yeah. making a, a party that can win state houses, that can win back the Senate, that could win the House, and that can win the presidency, none of which we currently control. Right. So, what, so what's that ha What's that thinking? Or, or, or are they all turned off? I mean, in your experience, are people yeah. turning away from the Democratic Party? What's the view uh, in the wake well, of Trump about I, that? Again, I, I, I don't, I've never considered, my, I, I never would have put Democrat high in, in the list of things I consider myself. Right, so, but, but you spend a lot of time with a lot of Democrats. I, I do. I, I think, I think um, a lot of people, I think the, the, the love for Barack Obama, which is continuing, I think has made a lot of people feel like sort of Obamaites, which is a preferable brand to being a Democrat. I think to the degree, at least the Democrats I knew, I mean, yeah, sure, I knew some enthusiasts for Hillary, but not that many. I think a lot of them felt, eh, yeah, I'm a Democrat to the degree I'll vote for Hillary, but like, eh, leave me out of it beyond that. So, uh, and then young people, my children, my millennial children, they don't, I mean, they are appalled and freaked out by President Donald Trump, but they're not thinking necessarily, I'm going to go in and, 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 and change the Democratic Party. Now, there are, they were also Bernie Sanders' primary supporters and, and, and remain so. So that, that battle between, um, you know, essentially the, the socialist, Democratic Socialist part of the Democratic Party and the, 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 the uh, you know, uh, Mnuchin uh, part of the uh, Democratic Party, the, the, the regular centrist Wall Street part, will, will be ongoing. But I don't, I don't feel... I, I guess in the same way, it's not the same way that Republic, the Republican Trump base rejected the Republican right. establishment, but it's analogous. I don't think there's that much, there's just like, eh, I don't, there's not the anger, but there's not the, I want to, I, I am, I am jazzed to fix it. Yeah. Kurt Anderson, thank you. We're going to talk about Donald Trump's thank you tour this week, right after this. Some quasi news, maybe some real news on the Trump transition today. Some very big names are now being floated for some very big positions. Trump's team is reportedly considering Joe Manchin, the Democratic senator from West Virginia, to potentially be energy secretary. Meanwhile, Chris Christie is said to be kind of poking around for the Republican National Committee chair job. But Sarah Palin, 
is apparently under consideration amongst several other positions for the Veterans Affairs Veterans Department job. So, John, do any of these make sense <laughs> at all? Well, there's no doubt that if those are my three choices, that the one that makes the most sense is Joe Manchin for the Energy Department. And I think, you know, it would be an interesting thing to reach out, have a good, good move on Trump's part to try to reach out to some Democrat, although many Democrats don't consider Joe Manchin to be much of a Democrat. Um, he's certainly a much more centrist and, and much more conservative than most of the Democratic Party. Those other two choices, though, uh, Sarah Palin, uh, for the Department of Veterans Affairs is a laughable choice, not just because she's not a veteran, but because the size of the bureaucratic organizational challenge of running that department is so big and it's a department in so much trouble that putting Sarah Palin into that job seems even more ludicrous than the notion of putting Chris Christie at the top of the RNC, given how many Republicans don't like Chris Christie. Yeah, I mean, even if you married her up with a deputy secretary who was very detail-oriented, that job is it requires such intense focus right now. It doesn't really it doesn't really make sense to do it for a lot of people. There's also talk tonight that perhaps the secretary of state slot is being expanded in terms of uh, who's being looked at. I thought yesterday that um, Trump was pretty much coming down between Romney and and Bob Corker, uh, but now it appears it's possibly being expanded, and it's really become kind of the biggest puzzle, the biggest mystery of where Trump's headed. We've also seen reporting today, uh, this afternoon, about James Mattis, uh, retired general, who's been considered the front runner as the potential head of the Pentagon, the Defense Department. Uh, that was floated in a couple of news, from a couple of news sources. The Trump campaign knocked it down and said that no decision's been made. But I still think it seems like he is the front runner for that job. I find that one uh, most consequential and potentially most interesting. Mattis is obviously very conservative, but many people in the military think he is eminently qualified for that job. Uh, the question, though, is whether if he were head of the uh, Defense Department, whether you would, he would be on a, a, a head, a, an almost inevitable collision course uh, with the NSC and with General Flynn, having two hard-headed, controversial, uh, uh, highly opinionated generals, one inside the White House at the head of the NSC and one at the Pentagon, that seems to me to be a recipe for trouble, for sure, if that's where we end up going. One of the things that people are wondering is, what kind of national security advisor is Flynn going to be? You know, is he going to be the honest broker model? Most people don't think he will. No. Most people think he'll be in the, in the Kissinger model. Right. And how, how that person, how, how Flynn will therefore interact with all the other people in the national security slots, not just defense and state, but also um, CIA, DNI, right. et cetera. Yeah. It'll be a fascinating thing to figure out. And, and what is Mike Pence's role? Right. What is, uh, what is the president's, uh, uh, Donald, President Trump's role going right. to be as well? Right. But you see my point about Mattis, right? I mean, given that he is seen as someone who has very strong opinions, very one of his virtues, people say, uh, I don't know the man, but one of the virtues that people say he has is that he's a straight talker. Um, he's, he's willing to express controversial views to anybody. He'd be a very strong leader of the Pentagon. We have seen turf war between the head of the NSC and heads of, and particularly the Pentagon, in the past. Again, given those two guys, both ex-generals, both with strong points of view, both willing to express them freely, I just look at that and say, just on the basis of history, that would be one of the very first big bureaucratic tangles that you'd see in the Trump administration, and maybe the most consequential. Yeah. All right. Uh, with Donald Trump in Ohio tonight on the first step of what some call the thank you source, some call the victory tour, we're going to talk about what it all means after these words from our sponsors.
Batting cleanup tonight is Matea Gold with the Washington Post, who joins us now from the Washington, D.C. newsroom. Hello, Matea. How are you doing tonight? Um, uh, I have so many questions for you, but let me, let's start with, uh, with the questions of, of whether what you thought about yesterday's Trump statement with relation to how he may or may not try to disentangle himself from his business ventures. I know you cover a lot about the nexus of, between money and politics. Um, we talked about yesterday on the show. What are your thoughts? Well, it doesn't actually really answer any questions about whether he's going to be able to effectively wall himself off from these potential conflicts of interest. I mean, he had already indicated that he was going to hand over the management of the Trump organization to his children, but that doesn't change his ownership or the fact that his name is emblazoned on all these hotels and resorts. Uh, so I think that really the, the devil's in the details. Um, it was very interesting to see the normally stayed Office of Governmental Ethics sort of overtaken by a strange tweet storm yesterday suggesting that he needed to divest himself of all of his holdings, which I think we're very unlikely to see. Um, uh, so if we're headed on, it seems to me we're kind of headed on a collision course here, right, where basically every ethics specialist, Republican and Democrat alike, all kind of agree that the only way to really deal with this conflict of interest thing is for him to liquidate all of his, of his businesses, put all the money in a blind trust. It seems like he's not interested in doing either one of those things, liquidating or a real genuine blind trust. So if we're on that collision course, what happens then if Trump takes some half measures? Where do we get, what, what, what's the next actual step in the world that will occur? Well, I think unless there's some real measure put into place to flag potential conflicts that showcases an effort by the administration to really avoid some of these landmines, every single time there is a policy issue before the new president that intersects with his business interests, this is going to be a story and he's going to have to answer questions about it. So I, I know that they realize this and they're, they're deep in kind of con conversation and planning of trying to deal with this. And several people have suggested that he perhaps should appoint some kind of independent overseer who could flag potential conflicts. But, I mean, we've—this is unprecedented. We've never had a president with this kind of holdings, both in the United States and abroad. So I just think it's going to be something that's going to dog him every step of the way and every decision he makes. Taya, speaking of precedent, you've got, uh, you know, Washington is filled with lobbyists, both staff lobbyists and hired guns for corporations all over America. How do you think or how do you know they're viewing what's happening with Carrier and the implications of that right now, not just come January? Right. Well, we've been doing some reporting about this today, and I think there's no question that Trump's decision to personally get involved in this uh, case and also pledge to crack down on companies and punish them with consequences if they try to move their operations overseas has really engendered a lot of worries in the corporate suites. And I think what's really alarming businesses that are otherwise pretty happy about the, uh, say, cabinet appointments he's making is this sense of uncertainty. Are they going to be targeted next? Are they going to be are they going to come under pressure for trying to uh, trying to outsource some jobs? And so I think there's a lot of consternation right now in the business community about how this is going to play out. Is it clear which lobbyists or lobbying firms are now, uh, you know, based on some sort of perceived or actual closeness to Trump or Trump's world are now being highly sought after by corporate and other interests? Well, obviously, anyone who's worked for the vice president-elect, Mike Pence, I think, is in high demand. We're also seeing lobbyists who work for Jeff Sessions, uh, rather staffers for Jeff Sessions, um, coming aboard as lobbyists. And, you know, anyone who has a connection to the new cabinet is going to be sought after. And I, I think we're, we're also going to see, probably despite the Trump uh, transition's pledge to keep lobbyists far from the administration, we're going to see a lot of those folks playing a big role. Uh, they simply have to deregister as lobbyists. And it that they can play a role in both the transition and, and potentially in the executive branch. There's obviously a lot of noise, Matea, about, uh, about the Goldman Sachs heaviness of, uh, of the, what seems to be shaping up to be the Trump administration, especially if Gary Cohn ends up running uh, the Office of Management and Budget. A, a lot of, uh, of the squawking about this, a lot of people pointing out the kind of the hypocrisy of it, given the way that Trump attacked Hillary Clinton for his connections, for her connections to Wall Street and to Goldman Sachs in particular. Again, will anything come of that, do you think, or does Trump pretty much have a free hand to dip, to dip as deeply as he wants to into the Goldman pool? 
I think it will be very interesting to see how he's received at these thank you rallies, the victory tours he's going out. Really, this is the first time we have a chance to see his supporters respond to him since he's made some of these decisions. I don't know how much of the intricacies of the names being floated has sunk in with people, but there's no question there's been a lot of focus on the fact that the Trump's cabinet is going to be filled with billionaires, with donors, with people who come from Wall Street. And so I, I don't think it's a coincidence that today they wanted to, to triumph the carrier deal and really give a nod to his pledge to, to working people. But that, that's going to be a balancing act for him. He has connections and ties to these folks, and he, you know, these are people he knows and he trusts and he wants to put in these positions. But it also seems to cut against the rhetoric he used repeatedly on the campaign trail attacking Hillary Clinton. We talked earlier on the show about, about the Trump and, and Congress and potential areas of, of common ground and potential areas where there could be trouble ahead. Um, just give us a sense of what, as you look down the road, where you think the biggest potential stumbling blocks are in terms of how Trump's going to work with Republicans, put aside the Democrats for now. I think immigration will be something to watch. I think there's a lot of anxiety, particularly on the House side, about whether they will be forced to try to craft some kind of bill that will answer the broad policy uh, goals that he has laid out. Those are the kind of details that I think a lot of congressional leaders don't want to necessarily get into when it comes to a wall. Um, and, and, you know, corporate tax reform is something that there's a lot of optimism about. And Paul Ryan said it again today. He sort of deflected on the question about Carrier and said, well, I don't really know all the details of the incentive program, but, you know, what we're pushing is a broad corporate tax reform that will be a boon to all businesses. So I think that's where we're going to see a lot of action and um, some perhaps avoidance of more of the hot button issues that got a lot of attention during the campaign. Matea, at this point, what are your unanswered questions about how Trump is organizing his government? I'm very curious about what kind of access people have who weren't part of the inner circle, who weren't necessarily Trump loyalists. He is clearly bringing in people to meet with him who uh, were not part of the campaign or were, are even Democrats. You know, how much of those conversations are really shaping his thinking? I mean, I think it's, it's interesting how struck he was by uh, his conversation with Romney and whether he obviously gets tapped as secretary of state will be very telling. But I do think there's going to be a, a little a bit of the battle here between the people who've been at his side for a long time and some of the newer voices who are coming in now to influence the administration. All right, Matea Gold, the great Matea Gold, thank you for being on the show. It was a delight as always, and we'll be right back with a special word about tomorrow's program.
Hey, Mark, I bet you weren't aware that today is our 525th episode of With All Due Respect, and you might be more aware of what tomorrow is. What's tomorrow? It's not only it's our 526th, it's also our, go ahead, say it. Oh, come on. Our last. Who are you talking to, me? Yeah, I'm talking to you, our last. Oh, yes. oh I'm sorry. Our yes, last. it's our last regularly scheduled yeah, episode of the right. show. The show is ending tomorrow. We'll have a very special, special episode for you. On 526. You won't want to miss it. You won't want to miss it because you got Jeff Goldblum, you got Jeff Daniels. Oh, sure, 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 sure. I sure, can't sure. tell anybody who's going to be on the show, all the special guests. I just yeah, want to just, give them a little, we got a lot a little of, tease. A lot of surprises, a lot oh, of special surprises. They're surprises, and they're big say, and they're special. Farewell to the North American viewing audience. A lot of montages. The montages are going to kill you. You'll laugh and you'll cry. Meanwhile, you can pass the time by heading to BloombergPolitics.com to read all about Donald Trump's tangled web of potential global business conflicts. Bloomberg Technology is up next. Until our last daily show, I'll say to you, from me and from Mark, the word we love most, sayonara. From Hong Kong, I'm Christine Harvey, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. President-elect Donald Trump is in Indiana today to celebrate keeping about 1,100 jobs in the state. Trump appeared with Vice President-elect Mike Pence, Indiana's governor, at a carrier factory in Indianapolis and warned U.S. companies there would be consequences for sending jobs outside the country. Indiana will give carrier parent company United Technologies $7 million worth of state incentives. And West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin may be tapped for Secretary of Energy. That's according to a report by Politico, citing three sources close to the discussions. But the conservative Democrat told the publication he hasn't been contacted by Trump's team and has no plans to travel to New York. Meantime, Politico is also reporting New Jersey Governor Chris Christie is looking to lead the Republican National Committee. Sources familiar with the talks say Christie told the Trump transition team he's interested in the job. The death penalty trial of Dylan Roof, the white man charged with killing nine black parishioners at a South Carolina church, begins Wednesday. Roof faces dozens of federal charges, including hate crimes, in connection with the June 2015 slayings at Emanuel AME Church. He is representing himself in the trial. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Christine Harvey. This is Bloomberg, and Bloomberg Technology is next.
Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, there may be dark clouds over startup land, but two of tech's hottest startup sites are joining forces to weather the storm. We will speak to Product Hunt's Ryan Hoover. Plus, our exclusive with Carlos Slim, Mexico's richest man, lays out his views on Donald Trump, Mexico, and the biggest threat to his telecom empire. And after lagging in navigation, Apple gets serious about taking on Google Maps and enlists backup from above. We'll explain. First to our lead, two of the coolest kids in Silicon Valley startup scene are getting together. AngelList is buying Product Hunt to create a one-stop shop for tech entrepreneurs. AngelList is a website that young tech startups use to raise money from investors, and Product Hunt is a popular site for entrepreneurs looking to stay in the know about up-and-coming apps. Product Hunt had already counted AngelList's CEO, Naval Ravikant, among its big-name investors in terms of the deal were not disclosed. Joining us now to discuss the tie-up, Product Hunt founder Ryan Hoover with me here in the studio, as well as Bloomberg Tech's venture capital reporter, Sarah McBride. Thanks to both of you Hi. for joining us. So, Ryan, why sell? Why now? You know, so I've known Naval now for a while, and he's an investor in Product Hunt, so he, he's believed in us since the very beginning. And it was just the right time right now for us as a company to, to partner with them. And we're thinking about our long-term future, talking more with Angelus and what their plans are. And there's a lot of opportunity for us to work together to ultimately help startups in different ways, not only from funding to talent to distribution and discovery. Now, as I understand it, you were also trying to raise money. I'm curious what you found in the fundraising environment. What's it like? Were you having any trouble? You know, the fundraising environment, there's a lot of talk about it. There has been for the past two years, really, and it's certainly changed in many ways. But today, really, companies, great companies are getting funded uh, still today. We're seeing more and more people building products, building companies, and also with less resources, less time. And we're also living in a world where there are distribution channels that exist, the internet, of course, but also the app store, Amazon, all these different places to actually distribute your products. So despite all this talk about the fundraising environment being difficult, the truth is it's actually a great time to be a maker and a, and a company builder. So but. why did you sell rather than raise more? Right now, you know, when we look at our strategy, like where are we going long term? If you look even 10 years out down the road, how do we get there faster? And many of it's through partnerships, and partnerships with Angelus make a lot of sense. We were looking towards revenue plans and things like that, and Angelus has a fantastic talent platform. They've invested a lot into it and continue to invest in a lot, and that's something that we can see being a part of uh, Product Time and Angelus together down the road. Now, Sarah, Bloomberg has a new measurement out, the Bloomberg right. Startups Barometer, which you say is down 15% from a high of last year. What exactly is this startups barometer? What does it mean? Okay, the startups barometer is a set of four different points that Bloomberg looks at. We've gone back years to figure out the data from a long time ago. And the four points I'll just show you on this screen are the number of deals, the amounts that um, those deals raise, how many of them are first financings. That's a really important metric of how healthy the industry is in the future and also the number of exits. So simply how many have been acquired or how many have IPO'd. So Bloomberg you know, mixes that all together with its secret sauce and comes <laughs> up with this uh, barometer. It's a very special sauce. Yep. Um, <laughs> would you echo what you're hearing from investors and entrepreneurs, uh, would you echo what Ryan just said about the environment? I might be a little bit less optimistic than <laughs> Ryan. I'm hearing that it's much harder to raise. If you look at the numbers, you see that Far fewer companies are raising Series A and at seed level, which is a leading indicator, will show a slowdown um, of those big exits in the future. But also, it's a little bit hard to tell because some of those funding rounds are actually going up in size. So fewer of them, but sometimes bigger. So for companies that aren't kind of blockbuster, it's a little bit hard to get funding right now. For the startups, Ryan, you know, that you know that maybe are in, you know, in this sort of transition period or, or middle ground, what are they doing? I mean, what are they planning? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of people who, I mean, obviously cutting costs is the easiest way to extend your runway to get to that point where you, you have that hockey stick growth where you can actually raise around. So we're seeing that. I mean, there's, there's also, um, you know, people do shut down companies. When it doesn't work out, that's, that's what you ultimately end up doing or raise a bridge around. Um, so it's, it's something that's the environment's change. We go through these, these periods ultimately. And to take it back to even AngelList, this is exactly what AngelList you know, was founded on to start with, is to help companies and investors connect and raise money to, to, to live. Right. So the funding environment is shifting. The political environment has changed. How does this play out, Sarah? I mean, do we see more 
acquisitions, more tie-ups like this? Um, do we see, you know, sort of the cream rising to the top, if you will? I guess it's a cream rises to the top uh, situation when the environment gets different, difficult. People say a really good company can IPO no matter what, but then there are just these uh, events that are causing a lot of problems. I mean, if you look at this barometer, you'll see around here in the summer, this is right after Brexit, um, that was just kind of an unforeseen complication that hit all kinds of markets hard, including the startup market. Um, so it's very difficult to tell what this administration is going to be like and how that will end up affecting startups. So Brian, you're going to be working closely with Naval Ravikant, the CEO of AngelList. What are the plans you guys are charting out for the next year in terms of what a tie-up looks like and how you actually help startups given uh, the environment we're looking at? So a lot of things will, certainly things will change, but a lot of it will stay the same actually. And this is early conversation with Naval during this, this whole process is what is your vision of, of Angelus and what is our vision and how do they come together? And so for the short term, not much will change. Our roadmap is staying the same, the community is intact, the site is still there, and that's our long-term plan. The way I equate this really is thinking about what, is, what did it look like when Facebook bought Instagram? You looked at that and, and you would think, I thought, that Instagram would be gobbled up and turned into Facebook photos, mm -hmm. but quite the opposite happened. You know, it's remained independent to some extent and it's grown to become a massive, massive platform within that ecosystem of Facebook itself. Interesting. All right. Ryan Hoover, CEO of Product Hunt, you are sticking with me. You're going to talk to me a little bit about Great. Snap Spectacles. Sarah McBride, our venture capital reporter, thanks so much for stopping by. Thank you. Another story we are watching, Box topped its third quarter results and raised its forecast for 2017, driven by large orders and deals, plus a new product push. I sat down with CEO Aaron Levy to talk about what is fueling growth. One of the cool things about our product is, is that it uh, makes sense for any size business in any industry anywhere around the world. So we do see pretty dramatic expansion simply happening because of new customers coming on board. We now have 69,000 uh, businesses that use the product. At the same time, we're seeing continued expansion within existing accounts. So some of our new products that we launched throughout the past year and a half um, that are sort of add-on products in terms of, of the revenue model uh, have actually been performing very well. Snap Spectacles, thanks to Snap investor Jeremy Liu of Lightspeed. His insights on the product next. This is Bloomberg.
There's been a major shakeup at Starbucks. Howard Schultz is stepping down as CEO next year, but staying on as executive chairman. The high profile executive built the coffee empire and served two separate stints as chief executive officer. He's being replaced by Kevin Johnson, who currently serves as COO. Johnson is known as a tech veteran before joining Starbucks in 2009 as an executive at Microsoft and Juniper Networks. Since Johnson became chief operating officer, Starbucks has rolled out mobile ordering across the U.S. and even tested delivery. Investors are rushing to snap up shares of Snapchat's parent company ahead of next year's IPO, but they're having little luck with the typical sources of private stock, like employees and other investors. This is according to a report by The Information. Consumers are facing the same challenges as they scout out the company's first hardware product, Spectacles. We were able to get our hands on the elusive specs. Snap's first investor, Jeremy Liu of Lightspeed, brought over a pair for a test run. How did you get your spectacles? So uh, I have a I, feeling you did not wait in line for six hours. I uh, I have some friends at Snapchat and I called in a favor. If you don't have friends at Snapchat, the only way to get your hands on Snap's new camera-clad spectacles is to stand in line for hours at pop-up vending machines across the country. One hundred thirty dollars a pair, or up to thousands on eBay. Let's do it. Lightspeed's okay. Jeremy Liu was a lucky one. He's one of Snap's first investors, so he didn't have to wait. How does it work? So uh, there's a little button here on the top, and when I press it, it starts recording video. You can see the light's gone on, so you yeah. know that you're being recorded right now. And after uh, it stops, then uh, it syncs through Bluetooth to my phone. So when I open my Snapchat app, it'll sync through to uh, get the video directly into Snapchat. The specs come in edgy colors, teal and coral, and a more muted black, and charge when clicked into the case with a rechargeable battery. They've got a certain cool factor, but you gotta wonder if spectacles will actually make a cool dent in Snap's business. When you heard that Snapchat was going to make something like this, was going to get into hardware, what did you think? What I found is that uh, Evan and the team there have just demonstrated that they know better than anyone else what their users will want. My turn. <laughs> All yours. Let me know Let's what give you it a think. Try. And you're recording. Oh, I'm recording. Can you see the little white? Oh, the yeah. Of your hey. Eye? The camera records circular video, allowing you to hold your phone vertically or horizontally to see the scene. So I went zip lining with my daughter and not having to worry about dropping a camera or a phone, but being able to record that experience, it was really pretty fantastic. So why do you think spectacles will do any better than these? I Google think Glass. Kind of obvious just looking at them, don't you? <laughs> Obvi, right? Remember, Google Glass retailed at $1,500, more than 11 times more than Spectacles. It could do a lot more things, though. Jeremy Liu believes that Snap's price point will help get the product into the hands of the masses. But will Spectacles be able to have long-term staying power? I want to bring back Ryan Hoover, CEO of Product Hunt. So you haven't tried it. Not yet. But not you just saw our little experience there. Uh, I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. What do you think? So I think it's, it's a brilliant move. I mean, Snapchat is, is executing so well on so many different levels, and it's very difficult for especially a software company to execute on hardware, and they're doing it in a very snap kind of way. They're doing it by making it a toy, making it playful, making it fun, and also, of course, introducing a price point that's accessible for a lot of people. Brilliant is a strong word. Really? Brilliant? I think it is. Even, even the execution of their distribution. They're, they're creating these vending machines. I mean, vending machines, when, since when were vending machines cool? Somehow they made vending machines kind of cool and also a marketing campaign by dropping them in different cities. They're, they're making them feel very exclusive, that's yes. for sure. I mean, I will say that I walked into it feeling very skeptical, but I could certainly see, A, uh, you would love these if you were a huge Snapchat user because it's just so easy to get the video to your phone and then into your app. Mm -hmm. um, B, if you have kids, uh, it sort of takes away that awkward moment when you pull out your phone and your kid yeah. automatically stops doing that cute thing that they were doing that you wanted to get a picture of. But do you think this is actually something that's going to add revenue to the bottom line or drive usage? 
Well, in, 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 a, in a big way. Yeah, long term, I believe this movement, it's not necessarily Spectacles, the first product, the first version that necessarily will, but it's the first step towards a hardware snap company, a camera company, how Evan puts it. And, you know, starting with something simple that just takes photos versus Google, they approach it with a very complex and very expensive product from the beginning. So you think it's more than just a gimmick, something fun? something fun around the holidays. I think this is actually more the future of what Snap is actually building. And it gives them a lot more flexibility to own the entire experience for the, for the user as well. That said, gadgets in general are kind of struggling. I mean, Google Glass didn't work out. Uh, you have Pebble potentially selling to Fitbit. You have GoPro. Uh, they just had a, a number of layoffs. Mm -hmm. You know, wh what's it really going to take to to make some of these techie gadgets, aside from your smartphone, really mm -hmm. take off? I mean, not many people can execute on that, especially execute on software and hardware very, very well. But if they can, it becomes so much more valuable. If you can own the entire experience and the platform and actually not depend on longer term Apple or, or Google and Android and other devices, then it becomes even more uh, exciting as a product builder. What sort of trends are you seeing at Product Hunt? between hardware versus software startups? So we're seeing a lot more, I mean, smart everything is, is coming and, and it's been you know part of the meme and the conversation for a long time, but we're seeing more and more smart things, whether it's like smart lighting and, and we have Google Home and we have smart ovens and all these different things that are connected to the internet that do interesting things. And we're still super early in that space. Uh, people are still exploring what can you do when you connect things to the internet. All right, Ryan Hoover, CEO of Product Hunt. Thanks so much for stopping Thanks. by. Great to have you here on the show. All right, a number of voices are chiming in to talk about what U.S. innovation will look like under President-elect Trump, and today we heard from Bill Nye. He weighed in on, the technology, on technology's role in the U.S. economy earlier today on Bloomberg Surveillance. Take a listen. You can hate me, you can hate everything, you can be a miserable hater person, but what keeps the United States in the game is our technology, our innovation. So let us, I hear, I'm hoping that we can find common ground on this. Invest in basic research. Uh, if we had better batteries, we would change the world. And if we invested in renewable energy technologies, then we would be having jobs right here in the United States. Coming up, if you've been thinking of a career change, we'll show you how to start earning an income through your Instagram account. And Bloomberg Tech is moving to a new time. Starting on Monday, we will be live 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific, an hour earlier, 6 a.m. in Hong Kong. Do not miss us. This is Bloomberg.
A story we are watching, Airbnb is toughening, toughening up home sharing limits in London and Amsterdam. Hosts will now need a license to rent their homes in London for more than 90 days a year and for 60 days a year in Amsterdam. This is coming at a time when the platform faces increasing pressure from cities and governments. Airbnb will automatically limit home listings on its platform from 2017. And turning now to Instagram, it is an app where filters help average people make their lives appear more glamorous or fun, with some everyday users striking rich thanks to millions of followers. But in this week's Bloomberg Business Week, our reporter Max Chafkin discovers that being Insta-famous is hard work. My colleague David Gurr asked him about it. Take a listen. Max, you're like me. You were like me uh, with a small amount of followers. You wanted to up that. What did you set out to do here? Uh, how did you set out to become Insta-famous? So my goal here was to sort of determine, as you say, just how hard this is. Is, is it something that anyone can do? Um, there are these people, they are, they're called influencers, is the, is the term of art. Um, they basically uh, take money from, from marketers to, to try to sell stuff. And I found um, an agency that, that sort of advised me on photography and, uh, and, and grooming and clothing and various other matters. And I, uh, you know, just started posting these uh, pictures on Instagram in a totally different character. Um, I also used uh, bots to try to, uh, you know, juice my following. Um, and you know, it was, as you say, it was, uh, it was difficult. And um, you know, it both gave me an appreciation for this stuff. It also, I think, showed me just how contrived some of it is. We're seeing you there with uh, with your cat. I, I cannot imagine why that was not leading to more followers. And I. I want to make no offense here, the, the, the stylists, the groomers, they had their work cut out uh, with you. They did a lot of work uh, to make you somebody who would get more followers on Instagram. You know, that, that hurts, but I, I'll, I take your <laughs> point. Uh, you know, how does this service, how do these services work? You go uh, with a couple hundred followers asking to become an influencer, willing to pay for that to happen. Uh, normally, you have to have a rather high threshold to be able to do that. So how does one become uh, at the lowest level, at the entry level, a member of what you call Instagram's professional class? So yeah, I mean these these agencies, these the, the sort of pro the professionals that provide services to these influencers, they, they normally don't talk to anybody with less than like a hundred thousand followers. Um, you know, they, they basically made an exception, f uh, you know, for the purposes of my article. Um, the, uh, the the in interesting thing with Instagram, which is sort of different from Twitter, is there's like no easy way to get a following. Uh, you, you know, there's no retweets, there's no sort of easy way to be rebroadcast. So basically, what you have to do is like you know jump around the internet, uh, you know, liking things. Things in the hopes that some of those people um, like you back, uh, and and then try to have something that is is worth looking at, which were these you know slightly ridiculous uh, pictures that I, uh, I you know I took with the help of, of some you know photography and some stylists and some great lighting, um, and yeah I mean there's there's certainly like a genre of this and it, it, it kind of looks a little bit like a you know paparazzi shot or something like that. But the thing that was you know most discouraging was just that. Um, you know, these pictures that I had taken before on Instagram that I really was proud of, I mean, they did nothing compared to these, like, kind of slightly cheesy fashion shoots that I that I did later, which, which performed much, much, much better. I think they look great, Max. I'm struck here as we look at photos from your Instagram account, some credit here to Alicia Siegel. Uh, explain here... Uh, how this works, right. there, there is a lack of genuineness to Instagram that I pick up on. I post pictures of my kids smiling, not her having a temper tantrum, for instance. But when I look at your bowl of granola there, not a photo that you took yourself. It's a beautiful bowl of granola, no, but I did not eat it. Um, and I can't really tell you what that yellow blob on top Some is. Some sort of custard. Um, basically, I was, uh, I was posting these fashion shoots, and then I was also trying to post, you know, pictures that I thought kind of looked like what you'd sort of expect would be on Instagram. And my, you know, advisor said, you know, these are, are frankly terrible. You need professional help. So there's like a, a, a class of photographers that basically just sell, you know, lifestyle content to Instagram influencers as if it were like a magazine. Bring it. Max Chakin, our Bloomberg Business Week reporter with my colleague David Gura today earlier on Bloomberg Markets. You can catch Max's full story in this week's issue of Bloomberg Business Week. It's a good one. Coming up, the folks behind Peter Thiel's fellowship program have a new venture firm. How they plan to find the next Mark Zuckerberg next.
I'm Christine Harvey, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of your first word news. Starting with France, French President Francois Hollande says he will not seek another term in 2017. The embattled leader has seen his popularity hit record lows after a number of terrorist attacks. Hollande made the announcement today in a televised address. And Thailand has a new king. The country's crown prince formally takes the throne to succeed his revered late father, who reigned for 70 years. The new monarch will be known as Rama, the 10th king in the dynasty founded in 1782. Former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair plans to invest $10 million in a new policy institute to fight the rise of populism. The Tony Blair Institute will serve as a platform to craft policy for the so-called center ground. Now that's the area in the political spectrum that's neither to the right or to the left. Blair's been a controversial figure in the UK for bringing Britain into the Iraq war. Well, hundreds of victims have reported child sex abuse within British football clubs. That's according to the BBC, citing the National Police Chiefs Council, which reports receiving a significant number of calls after former players made allegations of abuse against coaches. The council says more than 860 people have called the hotline it set up just one week ago when the allegations emerged. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Christine Harvey. This is Bloomberg. Now, it's just after 7.30 a.m. here in Hong Kong, 10.30 a.m. in Sydney. Bloomberg's Paul Allen joins me now with a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Tell us what's going on out there. Morning, Christine. We're off to a fairly weak start on the ASX. Uh, we're down about a quarter of 1% right now. Take a look at the organic food producer Bellamy's, though. That's uh, lost about a third of its value in the first half hour of trade after flagging weaker revenues uh, out of China. A better story for Grain Corp. Uh, Grain Corp up about one and a quarter percent. This is after the US giant Archer Daniels Midland flagged that it's going to be selling its near 20% stake in Grain Corp at uh, $8.53 per share. It's a pretty good discount of about 2% on Thursday's close for Grain Corp. Iron ore price has been behaving very weirdly. It's almost doubled in value this year, but uh, take a look at the action uh, on Thursday night. It was back up almost 9%, uh, reversing its steepest decline in two years just a day earlier. A lot of uh, analysts there speculating about speculation, much as you'd expect. A uh, quick look at the NZX over in New Zealand. That's looking flat right now. Nikkei futures also looking flat. And we've had a bit of data out of South Korea this morning. Third quarter GDP, 2.6% narrow missing estimates. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Silicon Valley heavyweight and Trump transition team member Peter Thiel is known for being a contrarian, to say the least, when it comes to everything from politics to his investing philosophy. His Thiel Fellowship gives $100,000 grants to two dozen college-age students each year on the condition that they drop out and start companies. Two people behind the fellowship have started their own venture fund called the 1517 Fund with the aim of taking things a step further. Joining me now to discuss 1517 Teen Fund co-founders and general partners, Danielle Strachman and Michael Gibson. You guys have been at this for about a year and a half now, and you've both been working with Peter for a long time, six yep. years or so. So talk to me about how this fund actually works. I know it's, it's seed, pre-seed to stage, but how is it different from a, a typical venture fund? So as far as a typical venture fund, all venture funds have some sort of um, goal or mission that they're trying to achieve. Ours happens to be focused on younger founders who are in high school and college and helping them to build their companies. So you really are looking for the next Mark Zuckerberg because you are looking for people who are really young. Yep. So, uh, you know, talk to me, Michael, a little bit about the people who are backing you because as I understand it, it's not necessarily for returns. Well, they are interested in, in this mission to find people who are working on things outside of tracked institutions. We, we're not against education in and of itself. We believe in learning by doing and the types of individuals who are so committed and passionate about what they're working on that they're prepared to leave school. They tend to be really interesting, dynamic people. And so a lot of our investors are interested in talking to and working with those are the people we funded. Yeah. And you've been working with the Teal Fellowship since the early days. Very controversial idea. What drew you to this idea that kids should not go to school, they should start companies instead? 
Uh, I've personally worked in alternative education for a long time. I worked with homeschoolers and also started a charter school that has an ethos of learning by doing. Uh, so I was personally drawn to the Teal Fellowship because it's the same thing of learning by doing, going out there and starting something, uh, and also making sure that young adults are not infantilized for too long is really important to me. What kind of success have the Teal Fellows actually had? I mean, so have you found this is actually a good formula? Yeah, absolutely. So for the fellows who started companies, uh, a lot of them are tracking very strongly now. Uh, you know, all told, I think, I, I forget the exact number, but it's north of a billion dollars in market cap aggregate of some of the companies started by fellows. And we're really excited to see the next wave. The tailwinds are really in our favor. We see younger people starting programming by, you know, at the age of 12, and by the time we meet them, maybe they have eight years experience. They're getting, they have role models that they can copy and emulate, and so we expect to see a lot more great companies come from. What about the times when it doesn't work out? Because obviously it doesn't work out for everyone. You know, is it been, has it been a waste of time? Have they learned something? How do, get, these are kids, right, overcome? So for these young people, there are a lot of opportunities for them. If they start a startup and it doesn't go in the direction they want to, there are lots of opportunities, whether it be hiring, going back to school, um, those are two in particular, but being out there and being able to say to someone at the age of 18 or 20 years old, I've been out there, I've raised money, I've you know, managed a team and things like that, that's a lot more experience than a lot of young people get. So I think the opp opportunities are still very bright for them no matter what happens. So Peter himself is an investor mm -hmm. in the fund, right? What has he told you about what he hopes to see, what he'd like? I think he loves that this is an extension of, of the theme behind the fellowship, which is really supporting people outside of these institutions, helping them on extraordinary careers without any kind of authentication by some authority. Uh, the name of our fund, 1517, comes from the Protestant Reformation. Uh, the little inside joke there is that uh, Martin Luther nailed his theses to a church door. Uh, protesting the sale of indulgences. These were pieces of paper the church sold at great cost, telling people it was a way to save their souls. Likewise, we say that universities are selling a piece of paper called a diploma, telling people it's the only way they can save their souls. Mm -hmm. And we think it was false then and it's false now. And I think that message and mission really resonated with Peter. Teal uh, has as we've heard, been trying to get some support in Silicon Valley, get some folks on a team to help advise President-elect Trump. Has he asked either of you? I know he's tapped some of the fellows. Have not been asked. <laughs> what do you make of his support for Donald Trump, which, again, Peter's a very, you know, contrarian views, as we know, and very much against the grain of the rest of Silicon Valley. We were surprised like everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't speculate beyond Peter's public statements yeah. for reasons of support. I think it ties into a lot of the themes that he's been thinking about. So at broad economic innovative stagnation across long periods of time. And, you know, beyond what he's said in public about shaking things up, I can't speculate. But, are you guys excited about Donald Trump or are you nervous? Uh, as a small L libertarian, I tend to uh, look at different ways of reforming institutions huh. than uh, democratic votes and uh, I, I don't know I'd look for other opportunities but I, I hope things work out on that note you are on the board of the Seasteading Institute which I have to ask you about so yep. this is the idea is they're doing research right mm -hmm. to build a city or island off the coast of California where you would start over you'd have your own new rules new laws it mm -hmm. was parodied on HBO's Silicon Valley right. yep. what's it what's the actual progress been so uh, it's not specifically to build a floating island off the coast of Ca California. It's really about there's no more le land left in this world for people to try new experiments and governance on. Uh, the idea isn't for pure anarchy, no rules. The idea is can we try new rule sets? Uh, and so there is some good news this week. The Seasteading Institute has come to an agreement with the French Polynesian government, a memorandum of understanding uh, that would allow for the first uh, creation of a zone in their coastal waters uh, for a platform where people might be able to run businesses under a different set of rules. So do you believe it will happen? And if so, when? Like how Absolutely. I mean, seasteading is happening right now. The Chinese are building artificial islands in the Pacific. They don't call them seasteads, and they operate according to Chinese law. But I, inevitably, in the next 50 years, there will be people who build structures at sea that operate according to different rules. So California, you think 50 years? Or so it'll be off the coast of California. I, I hope so, for our sake. All right, it's it's fascinating stuff. Mike Gibson and Danielle Strachman of the 1517 Fund. Uh, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much, guys, hey, for stopping hey. by. Thank Great. You.
A story we are watching. State-sponsored hackers have carried out a wave of destructive attacks on Saudi Arabia over the last two weeks. According to people familiar with the investigation, the hackers broke into the agency that runs Saudi Arabia's airports and erased data. They're also believed to have hit five other targets. Though the investigation is still in its early stages, digital evidence reportedly suggests the attacks came from Iran. Authorities say no air travel or airport operations were disrupted by the attack, but it was believed to be a show of force. We'll pick up on state-sponsored hacking tomorrow with FireEye's Director of Threat Intelligence, Laura Galante. She says Russian hackers did more than leak DNC emails. They help spread fake news stories on social media. Do not miss that conversation tomorrow. Up next, Apple Maps hasn't been exactly a darling of the tech world, but the company is putting a lot of resources behind it, now including drones to improve the service and take on Google. We'll bring you that story coming up. How bad is this? Be honest. Is this Windows Vista bad? It's not iPhone 4 bad, is it? Don't tell me this is Zoom bad. I'm sorry, Gavin. It's Apple Maps bad. from HBO Silicon Valley shows Apple Maps hasn't exactly been loved by its users. Since it launched in 2012, it's been riddled with errors, leaving it with a lackluster reputation as Google Maps has dominated the space. But Apple is making serious moves to change all that. Mark Gurman wrote about it for Bloomberg Technology. He joins me now here. So now they're using drones uh, to try to take Apple Maps to the ne next level. How will this work? Right, and let's step back a little bit. So Apple Maps, obviously the launch was bungled, but one of the reasons uh, that it was so you know, terrible at launch is because they had so much data they were pulling together from different providers, some providers including TomTom and other smaller companies, and they didn't source their own data. So a couple of years ago, they hit the streets with vans, very similar to Google. What Google has done, right? Right, what Google's done for a decade, and they're collecting their own data using camera sensors. But vans can only take you so far. They're very expensive, they require a lot of manpower, but drones, you know, they're smaller, they're under 50 pounds, they can fly around and really get into areas that fans cannot. So they've turned to drones. So they've gotten FAA approval to do this. Right, earlier this year they got FAA approval um, 
in August, FAA stopped requiring exemptions and approval to fly commercially, but Apple started looking into this earlier in the year. They got approval in March, and so this allows them to, you know, fly drones around. But the key here is they can't go over buildings or over people yet, so they're limited for the time being to regions that are not regulated, such as Amazon using the UK for some prime air mm -hmm. testing. But over time, the FAA is going to relax their restrictions, obviously, so Apple will be able to do more. Does Google use drones? Google, they've done drones some through their Skunk Works programs, uh -huh. uh, but other companies have done this before. It's actually a popular technique for really surveying, construction sites use it. You can actually see lots of people flying drones with cameras over Apple's campus mm -hmm. to try to get a look at how far it's, it's gone so far in terms mm -hmm. of construction. So there's been lots of maps and construction related applications for drones in the past. Right, we're looking forward to that campus opening next year. So they're also adding some new features, indoor features, features for pedestrians, Tell me about these. Right. So beyond the drones, which is a long-term initiative to improve the data, they're working on at least two new features for an iOS update next year. One of the features would be indoor mapping. So over the last couple of years, Apple's been using Wi-Fi, this technology for sensors called iBeacons, to sort of map out high traffic, high volume places like malls, airports, big museums, parks and such. And now, or not now, when they release this feature as soon as next year, you'll be able to navigate these places with the Maps app on your phone, just like you can navigate walking. Another feature is for the in-car navigation. So right now the Google Maps app will tell you, hey, you need to get in these two lanes in order to make it to your turn or your next exit on the freeway. Now Apple Maps will be able to do that next year. So how optimistic are you about this? I know you also talked about